Um, all right, good deal. Okay, so it seems that was just a glitch. Hey, Tyler, how are you? I'm good, and how are you? Welcome, everyone. We'll be started here in just a few minutes. We're going to give a little bit of time to make sure that all who come have room at the table. We had a rather large RSVP list for this one. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, you know what? You're not on mute. My sound was off. There we go. I'm sorry. That was my fault. No worries. If you're just joining us, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. We want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to join in on the Zoom. And we had a, a rather large RSVP list tonight. So excited to see you all here. We will get started in a moment. If you have questions in anticipation for our Q&A session at the end, you can either drop those off to us in the chat app button that's on the bottom of your screens, or you can just hold those until the end. In the meanwhile, if you would just do us a favor and press mute on your mute button so that we don't get um, background noise. We have people trickling in as we speak. So many familiar names, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Mikva, President Ray, Yasmin, hi Yasmin. Tyler, where's your hair? Oh, it's it's in the back of my head. Ah. <laughs> I haven't cut my hair like Samson since the beginning of quarantine last year. <sighs> so yes, waiting for the opportunity. Hi, Deneen. It's good to see you too. We're going to give it about one to two more minutes to make sure everyone gets an opportunity to jump on and then we shall get started. Hey, Reverend Moore, it's good to see you, Haley. It's so good to see so many familiar friends and faces. Emily Voigt, Eric, boss, how are you doing? Excellent. Great, Jackie, Jackie Hodgson, so good to see you. Karen Wells. Rebecca Back Blackburn. All right, folks, we will begin admitting others as they start to come here after the 730 mark. But welcome to tonight's uh, book launch meeting with Dr. Christoph Ringer's fantastic new book, Necropolitics. My name is Tyler Tully, 
It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. One of the best things about being a part of the CTS community means that our people are on top of online meetings. As I go through the list here, I see so many of you are already on mute. Thank you for practicing that online etiquette. That means a lot. Um, we were gonna have a, one, uh, a wonderful and fantastic time for conversation later. And in, uh, in just a moment, uh, we will be introducing some of the speakers for tonight. But I want to just draw your attention to two very important things. Um, as we move towards the conversation and question and answer time, I want you to know that you can either type out questions under the chat button to me personally, and I will pull from those and ask when the time is, is right, or if you feel comfortable doing that yourself, of course, you can always hit the little hand button. Um, if that doesn't work, you can always literally wave me down on the camera screen. I'll scroll through, and, and if you're moving fast enough, perhaps, it'll get my attention. Of course, that's a joke. I'll do my best to keep an eye on those of you who want to chime in, but welcome. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Ken Stone. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, my name is Ken Stone, and I'm currently professor of Bible, culture, and hermeneutics uh, here at Chicago Theological Seminary. And uh, one of the joys of being a senior faculty member at Chicago Theological Seminary is the experience of watching scholarly projects of faculty colleagues develop over time. And uh, this year's actually been an especially productive year for our faculty. Uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Professor, uh, Professor Rachel Mikva's new book. Uh, and in the coming weeks, uh, I look forward to celebrating um, Professor Zachary Moon's newest book. But tonight we are especially excited to celebrate uh, Professor Christoph Ringer's new book, Necropolitics, The Religious Crisis of Mass Incarceration in America. Uh, Dr. Ringer is our Assistant Professor of Theological Ethics and Society here at CTS. Uh, he earned his PhD at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, which I am personally proud to also be an alum of. Um, and as I recall, he can correct me on this. He also pastored a UCC congregation in Nashville. So his, uh, his commitment to bringing theology and ministry together is a long time commitment. Uh, and one of the reasons why we have him teaching not only ethics, but also our famous constructive theology uh, course that serves as part of our capstone process for our MDiv at uh, CTS. However, as I think a lot of you know, Dr. Ringer is actually from Chicago. And any of you know, uh, who know Professor Ringer will be aware of his passion for uh, community engagement here in our city. Um, I continue to learn from him uh, about our city's issues, which are significant. <laughs> we'll just, uh, we'll say that. But you will also be aware of his passion about the crisis of mass incarceration and his theological interpretation of it. Um, he's been teaching a course on this topic since he came to CTS. It's one of our most popular courses. And uh, I think it's a good example, an excellent example of how scholarship and practical ministry are joined at CTS. And actually several of Dr. Ringer's courses are among our most popular. Uh, he's been teaching on Howard Thurman and on uh, African-American political theology. So any of you who are looking for good courses to take at CTS, uh, you know, you wanna come back if you're an alum, uh, you'll find plenty of offerings from uh, Professor Ringer. So with that, we're gonna ask Professor Ringer to make some brief introductory remarks about his book, how he came to write it, uh, what he understands his primary contributions to be. And then we'll have a response to the book from one of our PhD students, uh, Terrence Mayo, uh, followed by some further reflections from the author, uh, maybe in more detail, uh, Dr. Ringer. And then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, that will be facilitated by Tyler, as, as he mentioned, uh, if, if you want to list your questions in the chat, that's, uh, that's great. 
Um, or if, if you want to wait and, and ask them, that's okay too. So without further ado, we'll turn the conversation over to uh, Professor Ringer. Dr. Stone, thank you so much for that um, generous uh, introduction. And thank all of you for gathering here uh, this evening, taking time out of your schedule to, uh, to share this, uh, this moment with me. I do appreciate uh, the community and, uh, and the support that CTS has offered me um, in not only producing this work, uh, but also providing an institu institutional home uh, for both my scholarly uh, commitments as well as uh, practical ones as well. So um, books often have uh, lots of different starting points and I'll just mention uh, one aspect that brought me to this work. Uh, in 1995, I was present at the Million Man March. And during the early 90s, many activists were trying to sound the alarm about these extraordinary rates of incarceration, uh, the war on drugs, the disparities within uh, sentencing and punishment for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. And I remember uh, at that time, the Reverend Jesse Jackson just basically laid all of this out there for a national and potentially international audience. And I remember thinking to myself in 95 that now we know, right? The information is out there. We can't, uh, we can't deny this. And I genuinely thought that we would move in a different direction. In 1995, there were just under a million, by 800,000 persons who were uh, in state and federal uh, facilities. Uh, after 95, each year, the uh, rates just kept going up all the way up to just over 2 million persons who were uh, incarcerated. And so in my political naivete, thinking that something would change just because we were now confronted with it, uh, part of this project is to say, how is it that mass incarceration persists in spite of all of the mountain of empirical research as to why it's such a bad public policy. Uh, literally, um, uh, research has been produced by political scientists, sociologists, the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, there's just no shortage of information as to why this um, is really a poor or horrendous decision to be made by society. So, um, so that's the kind of one entry point. And as scholars and activists have grappled with this, what we found is a number of ways in which people try to understand the problem. Some call it the new Jim Crow. Others believe this is genocide. Others call it neo-slavery. Uh, others refer to the 13th Amendment. What I wanted to do in this book was a few things. The first is to say that these aren't merely academic debates. Right? How we understand a problem often determines how we respond to it. So I was trying to figure out not so much what mass incarceration resembles in terms of eras of the past, but what is it right now? What are we actually coming to terms with? And I recall the uh, wonderful quote by Stuart Hall, who says, you can't address a social contradiction simply by getting rid of the term that you use to describe it. You have to actually kind of go underneath and figure out what's going on. And so um, that was really kind of the origins of the work. And um, surprisingly, as I kind of dug deeper, I found myself in a really interesting and surprising space. I discovered a tradition that I previously did not know about, which was execution sermons. Uh, during the Puritan era, these were sermons given by clergy, uh, literally standing next to someone who was going to be condemned. And the role of the sermon was to explain to the community the meaning of this death, to try to get the community to identify with the depravity of humanity, to confess their own sins. But what was interesting is that when you look at these body of sermons, when the offender was black, there was also another message there. And the message was that this is what happens when you pursue freedom. And so the idea that black people were not capable of self-governance, right? They were, were in need of discipline, containment, punishment is right there in the Puritan era. And black freedom 
has always been indexed to criminality and understood as a threat to what they call the well-ordered society. And so I began to trace the ways in which that understanding uh, continues to reverberate throughout American history. And as such, what the book tries to do is actually what it does, it provides a religious explanation uh, for mass incarceration, not just a religious response. So the book really is designed to be in conversation to say that religious and theological studies has something genuinely um, unique to offer our understanding of, of this problem. And, and lastly, I'll just say, the goal is to really understand how is it that such a problem becomes normalized? Or how did it become rationalized and legitimated? Um, what we often call the banality of evil. Or how does this just recede into the background and become a part of our everyday ordinary lives? So I'll stop there and um, just as a kind of introduction and I'll allow Terrence to um, give a response. Thank you for so much. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ringer. And thank you for the opportunity to be with you all this evening. Uh, I feel my Baptist coming out. I count it as an honor and privilege to be here tonight. <laughs> um, but um, first and foremost, let me give thanks to CTS for this amazing opportunity as a PhD student to respond to this wonderful body of work Dr. Kristoff has presented um, and give thanks to um, all that are here tonight. Um, for my time allotted, I want to just briefly talk about how the kind of essential themes um, resonated with me, but also caused me moments of thought and provocation around the issues of religious and mass incarceration. Um, and then think through quickly some possible practical processes that are inspired by the work that is giving um, through Dr. Ringer's uh, work. And then um, quickly talk about um, how Dr. Ringer achieves uh, his thesis and goals within his writing and possible ramifications of further dialogue around this information. So as Dr. Ringer has uh, pointed out this evening, uh, the book's central question is around mass incarceration, but more specifically, um, it looks at how we struggle um, with mass incarceration, death, death making um, and the correlation between um, the process of dying so others can flourish. This conversation is not a new one and has been uh, mentioned as Dr. Rinker said previously um, in sociology, political theory um, and so on. But Dr. Rinker brings a religious view to this methodology around looking at how mass incarceration um, is influencing um, our daily lives and investigates um, this emergence of it and how it is sustained in the American life. This religious view uh, takes upon, upon the work of um, a phenomenological methodology, including those voices of Dr. Charles Long, also uh, Foucault and uh, Dr. Um, I'm sorry if I mess up his name, I'm trying to get her, uh, Akili Mayambi. It's important to know that Mayimbi's work um, takes, takes Foucault's initial works of biopolitics and then re re reconceives it and um, brings it to a notion of talking about how the power of life can become de a deadly form of power. Um, it is not only done subconsciously, but consciously in this endeavor um, to see the disdain between life and death, ruling parties and those um, in subjugation, and also those difference between being in political power and those not. It's important to also note that the subjugation of life to the power of death is integral to what we talk about uh, necropolitics. Um, so there must be this duality, or there is this duality between uh, the death of others. And in this case, um, we know that uh, from data uh, that includes majority of black and brown bodies in America uh, to the flourishing of uh, white bodies and uh, white society in America. Mahimi further points out that there are various types of weapons that are deployed 
um, in the interest of this destruction of personhood, persons, and community in order to create this death world and this new way of looking at how populations are contended against each other. This is important because it lays a groundwork for an understanding of how ne necropolitics works as a social political tool that re regulates the life, communities, socioeconomic polities of individuals throughout the United States. It also employs an understanding or a, a underpinning of the understanding of the necessity of how state terror works out between police policing, mass incarceration, and um, imprisonment. It also talks about how the shared use of violence takes place within uh, militias, paramilitias, para um, and also has we seen most recently um, on uh, the White House itself. This is important also to note because we can even see it in uh, as America stands as a city state um, and deals with the ramification of being uh, always consistently at war. So this coercion itself has become a market commodity where war and the juxtaposition of the poor and the rich is found to be substantially um, separating um, in it. What Ringer does and provides for us is an example of the theological ramifications of this work that Mayan Bay talks about, which is critical as, as critical as we think about how and why um, our socio-political ideologies match up to our theological uh, ideology. Uh, theological claims. He also challenges us to think about how we will wrestle with, um, sorry, how we wrestle with having a uh, religious voice or theology that really looks at um, polarizing opposites of the white body and the black body. It also causes us to think about and wrestle with how we have theologies that make it okay to streamline or think about sidelining minoritized popula populations in order to increase the flourishing of my, uh, major majoritized populations. Specifically, this is seen in how uh, mass incarceration and social oppression plays out and contributes to the assumptions, ideologies, and myths about Black bodies and Black communities. It's also important to note that Dr. Ringer brings a religious voice that challenges us to rethink our theologies. So to think about how we view not only black and brown bodies, but also how we view uh, the context of Jesus in these discussions around in black, and black and brown bodies. It also causes us to think about what is the critical role in religious institutions as we're serving the greater good and as we're moving forward, this thought about um, liberating those from mass incarceration. I, I would suggest that Dr. Ringer uses an abolitionist view to talk about and discuss um, how we must decrease and destroy our current ways of using mass incarceration, right, to uh, kill and destroy black and brown communities and revision and renew a new way of thinking about accountability in our communities. Also, it's important to note that Dr. Ringer's uh, work brings in context the theoretical moves around this conversation to also include those about pop culture. He endlessly weaves together discussions about human development and communal settings from The Wire, an HBO show from the um, early 2000s, and brings that into context about the daily life and struggles of Black people living in Baltimore. This important work brings together the lines of, again, of the theoretical and the practical, and gives us glimpses in the possibilities to, think, to further think about how we morally justify some of these actions and how we move towards liberation. Dr. Ringer also gave me pause thinking about how the God of necropolitics and that theology plays out not only in white congregations, but also in black congregations that seek to devalue, demean black queer bodies and communities and cultures. 
It also poses a thought process around the necessity of duality and how in Black queer theology, we try to move away from that duality. And so it gives this uncomfortable moment of thought around how do we use duality in a way that is justice seeking and not death dealing. And so in my closing, uh, I wanna thank Dr. Bringer for this important work to continue the conversation around mass incarceration, policing, and the social political ramifications within our country. Also to point out the necessity to keep the conversation going as we look at, um, as Dr. Bringer points out, the necessity to dismantle systems and also struggle with how we let systems um, continue on in our country. And so as we seek for liber liberation and justice, how does that then play out in our politics of life and death, success, flourishing, and those that do not get to meet the American goals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Thank you. Thank you. Y'all give him a hand clap. He worked that out. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Terrence. That, that was a really, a really good overview and you've captured uh, so much of what um, the book is attempting to do. And I'll just um, highlight a couple of things. Uh, Terrence really did rightly note the centrality of the question of populations. Right? Um, that um, part of what Membe is doing uh, is thinking about the knowledge that we produce about populations and how that is central to our contemporary understandings of governance and uh, in our society. For example, if you pursue an MDiv, uh, you may uh, think about your ministry as relating to the homeless population right? or a population that you are kind of called to minister to. And part of what I try to do in the book is to say that many of the representations um, of Black people as animals and criminals, it isn't just that they operate as stereotypes or in, ter in terms of bias, rather they actually operate as rationales of governance, right? The rationale of not only public policies, but the use of force and the rationale behind uh, the use of deadly force. So the book tries to track the ways in which those representations are actually embedded uh, in public policies. Similar to um, Terrence rightly mentioned the uh, use of uh, popular culture, sociologists have long recognized that for uh, most of society, what we know about jails and prisons and police often comes from popular culture. Uh, and oftentimes people draw on that in terms of how they engage politically even if what is depicted in popular culture is radically different than what actually goes on in uh, jails and prisons and with police. And so that critique is important because popular culture is a major source of legitimation when we think about the question of, of mass incarceration. So it's not just mere entertainment, rather it does reinforce certain kinds of, of assumptions about criminality um, and social problems. Um, Terrence, I wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit more about kind of the role of, of um, you began to talk about uh, the role of like queer theory and moving beyond duality. Um, and that duality is so uh, critical. Uh, part of what I showed in the book is uh, part of the, what I call the God of necropolitics or America's God is this notion of freedom that is predicated on the social death of others, right? This kind of racialized freedom. And so I was, if you had other thoughts on maybe thinking about moving beyond that, that duality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I, it caused me to struggle because I saw both sides of the argument, right? So one, the queer side of wanting to get away from dualities because in many times in queer communities, dualities have been used to oppress us even more. Um, while, uh, while in your argument, you show a clear linkage between life and death and the duality uh, of justice and disenfranchisement, um, I think it's also important. What I think 
is 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 still there for me to wrestle with is how how can duality be justified through a queer lens mm -hmm. um and that is a question i know many queer <laughs> theorists are, are kind of questioning and but as we look at moving towards um a body of work that really sees an analysis of of duality um, as strictly negative, right? Is there a redemption quality that can be found in it that can use, uh, be applied to a, a queer of color critique um, that understands that the black queer experience is much different um, than a white queer experience, right? And so how do we use that um, justified or liberated duality to talk about uh, the gray areas that we find in black communities and black life. One of the one of the things that um, one of the chapters that is often hard to articulate, or even some of my colleagues have struggled with, is uh, when you look at Stanley Tupi Williams and other figures who have uh, what I describe as this religious experience of redemption within the very structures of death, of social death, right? Um, and so there's a way in which it's all, there's a challenge in articulating that without making the claim that those structures themselves are redemptive. Right? Uh, we see this even with Santonia Brown Long and her experience and how her religious experience um, kind of guided her and how she understands her own journey um, to clemency. So I'm wondering if there's kind of resources there um, to think about that there is a this redemption that we see, uh, these religious narratives from within that duality that, that emerge. I did want uh, also too to mention um, part of part of what Terrence mentioned going back to this kind of idea of of the god of necropolitics. And um, part of what I argue in the book is drawing from Charles Long um, that this particular god, this understanding of God as what Charles Long calls uh, the religious depth of a society. Right? It's a depth that a society draws on or understandings that society draws on in times of crisis. Right? Um, and so that what many sociologists have referred to as kind of um, the backlash argument for mass incarceration. Right? And mass incarceration is kind of this backlash to the gains of the 1960s, uh, the social movements of the 1960s. What I try to show is that that backlash is actually perennial. Right? Uh, and that these themes reemerge, right? Uh, in times of, of crisis, um, they reemerge in order to kind of really uh, Reinstantiate a certain understanding of, of society. And we're living through that uh, again right now with uh, the insurrection, uh, the ability to kind of overturn the election, uh, the current efforts to really um, uh, inaugurate or reinstantiate a kind of white minority rule. Uh, this is part of what we're, we're living through. So the book also tracks that uh, as well. And Dr. Ringer, in that, um, I was interested to see if you had thoughts about um, how the media plays a big part in kind of codifying these images and roles and assumptions of Black and Brown bodies and communities and how they play, specifically as we've seen in our, our, um, our last outgoing uh, president um, in shifting the viewpoint of the country. Um, so it substantiates the same death dealing culture and codifies it in generation after generation after generation. Um, how do you see that kind of media playing a part in that? It's a, it plays a huge role. Uh, I mean, there are numerous examples, whether it is um, Donald Trump talking about um, you know, immigrants as animals and racists or even uh, in New York, uh, the famous uh, mayoral race where uh, squeegee men, the folks who wipe your 
your uh, windows were referred to as vermin and insects and rats. And uh, there's this long history. And uh, not only do you see that, that kind of animalization and criminalization, but also what I try to show in the book is how those representations often um, operate for large segments of the population, those images often stand in for, right? Entire geographic areas that they may, may not have ever visited, right? So there's a way in which certain images stand in even within a city. And that has a huge impact on, on issues of public policy. One of the major ones uh, I look at in the book is kind of the, the mythology of black on black violence you can actually trace when that language began to appear in journalism, uh, kind of co-present with the rise of mass incarceration. And what that mythology did was we have, again, we have lots of research as to the social conditions, right? That create violence. We have lots of research as to uh, the conditions that need to be put in place to begin to address it. But what black or black violence did it made the violence of black communities a problem of blackness instead of violence, All right? So that the violence in black communities is disconnected from the knowledge that we have and society is simply absolved of any responsibility, right? So that uh, violence within a black community becomes this mystery, this problem of blackness that somehow or another black people are psychologically damaged. So it ends up participating in a long history of, of what we call kind of the damaged psyche thesis of, of black people. It seems like a very natural time to transition to some more questions and answers, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ringer. Um, we had a fantastic question for Dr. John Thomas who asks, we're tempted to juxtapose theologies of containment or control with theologies of liberation. Are there ways to think about these theologies in engagement with each other in more positive ways? That's a really good question. Um, I think the answer is yes. And, and the answer is yes, because of a practical concern, really. And that is uh, that once you move from uh, the claims of liberation theology right, into praxis, you then have to deal with the kind of ambiguities along the way, right? You have a certain kind of vision of society, um, but you still have to um, address concrete harms. Um, and one of the challenges that um, any of us doing this work has is to take very seriously um, the feelings, the beliefs and the viewpoints of those individuals who do live in communities that are beset by extraordinary um, levels of, of violence. And so you're always, so you have to kind of, of uh, work both sides of that, if you will, and be sensitive to how you, how you negotiate that. Because otherwise, what you really do is you lose the ability to build relationships right, that are broad enough to actually tackle the problem if you don't have that, that sensibility. And there may be times um, when forms of restraint are, are necessary. Right? So one of, the, one of the challenges I think in, in discussing abolition is the idea that it is a process. Right? It is a long-term process. I always quote Miriam Kaba who says that uh, abolition requires the urgency of now and the patience of a thousand years. Mm -hmm. This really is about building a fundamentally kind of new, um, questions. Let, me, let me phrase it this way. It is about the reconstruction of society, right? And to think about social goods in ways that don't make prisons necessary. Uh, but you can't do that work without uh, running into those moments where um, some kind of restraint is necessary. Got a follow-on question from Dr. Ray. Um, it's about your sourcing, especially with Mbembe. He asks, why did you use necropolitics specifically? Was it a preference for Agamben over Foucault? Are Foucault's concepts of discipline and punishment incapable of sustaining the wholly irrational category of race? 
Great question, great question. Um, in many ways, you kind of, Dr. Ray, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, there are some things that uh, Foucault, uh, well, let me, let me back up, let me say this. When you think about Foucault's discipline and punish and anyone working on issues of, of punishment and incarceration, uh, you just have to travel through Foucault, right? It's just a part of our landscape. But Foucault's understanding of, of, of discipline, punishment, sovereignty, it's really drawn from a kind of image of the monarch. Right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, of, of sovereign king. But it doesn't really address that in American history, popular sovereignty has always been racialized. Mm. Right? So the problem of, of, you know, we see these police officers who are, you know, um, we all, we see kind of get off. Well, part of the challenge of having a jury of your peers that your peers are, are the problem. Right? So when you have a popular sovereignty that's already racialized, uh, you have to find another entry point. Also too, uh, Foucault's understanding of kind of biopolitics um, as well as how he engages kind of capitalism didn't quite capture right, what was going on with, with incarceration, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't quite capture this kind of circulation of not only actual death and dying, right? But the role of, of the images of black people in terms of social death. Mm. So it really was, there was something in um, a Chile Membe's work that actually complemented uh, my engagement with Orlando Patterson. So it really was my engagement with Orlando Patterson and the idea of social death mm. that led me to, uh, to Membe. Um, and one of the, just very briefly, uh, my engagement with Patterson is that oftentimes in the academy, people use uh, Orlando Patterson to talk about social death in a very general way. But oftentimes they fail to realize that part of what, part of the value of Patterson is that he shows that social death is tied to institutional formations, right? That is used to kind of track historical periods. So you have to figure out, well, what does social death look like in this moment? Um, and so it really was kind of my engagement with, with Patterson that led me to, uh, to Membe and Necropolitics. Thank you. I'm also very curious uh, to think a little bit more about the way that the white media, the white discourses, white institutions abstract a paradigm of blackness usually filtered through a lens of animality or psychosis or psychopathy, what, whatever the milieu has at the moment. Um, and how that stands in, not, in, not only for po populations, but as you said, spatial geographies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the city. Um, the reason that it, it, it made me curious, because it, it reminded me of the first statement you made around empiricism, how we're confronted with all this information and yet that information isn't driving change. And it seems to me that both of these are related to liberal humanism and sort of the ideals, the ideal humanist, um, you know, mythologies that we have grown up with in the United States that, that make us feel like um, we are the master and commander of our own ship and that we navigate an empty space in the world on our own and that we can make decisions and read the signs as we go. But what you are, what, what, what you seem to be drawing out for us here through Foucault, through Mbembe and through these abstractions is that um, oftentimes we're not as rational as we think we are. And this duality, this dual relationship of freedom and unfreedom that exists in the United States seems to be an underside that we're not exploring. Um, do you see a connection in that and, and how so? I think the, um, the best way to, to begin to answer your question is to, um, I draw a lot, there's a, there's a particular insight from, from Charles Mills that I find kind of central to my work. And what it talks about is that the, uh, the reproduction of racism in society, right? That a racist society produces its own epistemological ignorance, right? That it must disavow itself of its own actual workings. And so I think that the that duality of freedom and unfreedom mm 
is that oftentimes there are multiple ways in which we shield ourselves mm. from understanding the ways in which the flourishing of particular communities are dependent upon the subjugation of others. Right? And so part of what I try to do in the book is to give very kind of, of, of concrete examples that integrate um, these issues of, of representations, public policy, and the concrete effects. So the, the irony is that, um, you know, I use those theories in order to bring something into view. That is, so it's, it's a way of getting at something very concrete, right? Mm -hmm. through, through the kind of, of stepping back. Um, the example that I give in, in the last chapter of the book is um, when Illinois state budget was in an extraordinary crunch. Um, you had uh, organizations on the West side that were saying to the state, hey, we're doing this work in the communities, anti-violence programs, um, you know, feeding the hungry, et cetera. And we're dependent upon these government grants. Meanwhile, you had a prison in Peoria that was also lobbying the state to stay open. And I show how it is that um, the, the, this prison was able to lobby to stay open, even though they had slated to close it. We made concrete choices to keep that open and allow other nonprofits to close right? mm. and to be able to track those, those choices and to be able to track how it is that a community says, look, we can't allow this prison to close and to force lawmakers to privilege that community over the community <laughs> that actually has uh, the folks that are in that prison in Peoria, right? And so to be able to kind of draw out those, those dynamics. Uh, another example that I often give is um, there's an organization I sit on the board of and there was one of the staff members received a call from a member congregation. And the congregation said, we want someone to come out to our church and talk about mass incarceration, but we don't want them to mention the state budget. Right. In other words, <laughs> we, we want you to talk to us about this, but don't mention the actual kinds of connections mm -hmm. right, um, that would possibly implicate our own political choices. So one of the major um, themes in the book is to reframe mass incarceration, not as a social problem, but a social symptom, mm -hmm. a fundamental symptom of our political arrangements. So we're getting, getting some fantastic questions in the comments here. First one's from Dr. Stone. He asks, I would be curious to hear a little more about Dr. Ringer's thoughts on how popular culture was shaped by our views of mass incarceration. The Wire, Oz, some of this, especially Oz, also uses some very problematic notions of queer sex. Mm -hmm. To come back to Terrence's queer of color questions, has the so-called golden age of television actually made this worse? That's a really good question. And uh, I think that um, popular culture is, is really mixed bag here. Uh, and it's interesting that you mentioned Oz because I mean, Oz, there was something about Oz that, that um, I'll put it like this, many people, it's hard to depict the issues of isolation, uh, profound isolation, boredom, et cetera. But there's something about Oz that made people think that the only thing that happens in prisons all day long is that people are having sex, right? <laughs> right? And so that was one of the problems with Oz. It was like every single scene, somebody's getting oral sex or there's anal sex. And it was like, you know, so it does really give people uh, a distorted image right, of what goes on. The benefit to the wire, I thought, and part of my, it's interesting because in, when I was in graduate school, my advisor was like, why don't you talk about Oz? I was like, because Oz doesn't get you to the answers to the questions that I'm raising, right? It, Oz participates in a long history of kind of depictions of prisons, but it doesn't get you to how it is that jails and prisons have emerged in mm -hmm. our current landscape. The value of the wire was that the city itself was the main character. So that uh, William Julius Wilson, for example, said that the wire was some of the best ethnography that we have. It allowed you to kind of season by season, peel back a social structure 
and to show how individuals are impacted by those structures. So it doesn't deny agency, right? And, but it also does, it, it brings into view what oftentimes we, we describe um, within activist circles and academic circles as social structures, but oftentimes our language can be very uh, abstract. Mm. The wire gives flesh to that, right? It allows you to actually kind of see it play out. We're getting some good questions about that um, interaction between the theory and the practicality. And, and um, for those of us who have been following the development of your work, it's always been rooted in praxis. It's always been rooted in communities. I, I'm curious how, especially this dualism of life and unlife that both Foucault and Mbembe bring out, but especially in the American key, Dr. Mikva asks, I've heard you a couple of times use Ruth R Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism from Golden Gulag, which is a fantastic book. The state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death and premature death being the key there. Mm -hmm. She asks many analysis of racism don't grapple with death as its, animated, Adam, as its animating feature as yours has, how might religion help us get our minds around and challenge this terrifying telos? That's a wonderful question. And I think religion, well, one, I think part of why um, many, part of, I think many, part of why many of our, our theories or understandings of racism don't deal with this uh, is one is what I think Dr. Mikva says is it's terrifying, right? To have to come really face to face with this as its animating feature. Uh, but the wonderful thing about Gilmore's definition is it reminds us why the work is important. And I think that those of us in religion who may be more comfortable, right, talking about issues of, of death, um, I think we have resources to bring to the table to be, be, be able to expand both our, um, not only our understandings and our practices, but to be able to contribute it to the broader society and to mm. be able to think about um, how we can be a resource for helping society grapple with this. And I, I'll give you a concrete example from, um, uh, from my own experience. You know, the, the only reason why I'm uh, in ministry or teaching at a seminary today <laughs> is that there was a moment in Springfield Baptist Church just uh, on the north side uh, in Evanston, um, there was a, a drive-by shooting. This was early 90s. And um, what changed, it changed the direction of my life because I saw ministers come together and say, we have to stop lying. We cannot lie over another funeral again. And what they said was, this, God did not call this person home. Mm. This person was shot by somebody who should have been his brother, right? And so that move, right, to say, hey, wait a minute, we've got to stop uh, uh, telling the untruth about death in our sanctuaries. Mm. And it was a moment that said to me, wow, we can, we can be honest here, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, we can, we can interrogate our own practices and begin to see how we have something of a value, Right, that there's something I think that religious leaders and people of faith can communicate um, that a number of our religious traditions, that issues of death and dying are um, part of our self-understanding. So it's, it sounds almost as if the church is capable of making that same type of rationale move that uh, you, were, you were mentioning earlier. Um, I've got a question from Gina McKinney. She says, with Dr. Ringer's vast background and specific experience as a pastor, how would he use this book and the knowledge it contains to bring this forth to the congregation and development of ministry works to begin to address this issue in the development of real and tangible change that's not just lofty but practical? How do you see this working out on a congregational level? You know, I think the the text itself, my hope is that the text itself will be a, it provides a certain way, uh, a certain perspective, right? But then the uh, kind of practical work, right? Really happens in 
um, whether it's through teaching, whether it's through sermons, whether it's through different kinds of ministries. In other words, the book itself doesn't provide that blueprint. But what I hope is that if we can take this certain way of, of seeing a certain perspective, right, we, can, we can begin to bring it into the life of churches. I'll give you a concrete example. Um, one of the things that I came to realize in doing this work is that um, I grew up in a tradition in which when you heard the sermon of uh, the story of Lazarus and the culmination, the climax of the sermon is when Jesus tells Lazarus to come out, mm -hmm. right? But there's another verse where Jesus says to those, the community that's standing by, unbind him. Mm. And oftentimes that verse is not a part of the celebration, right? But rather there's this moment where there's a responsibility on the faith community to unbind him. And I would argue as a form of public witness to ask whether or not we are contributing to policies that bind people to poverty, right? that bind people to punishments after they have served their time. So there's a way in which the perspective, I hope, will give us new ways of reading sacred texts, mm. new ways of thinking about our traditions, and new ways of thinking about uh, creatively how we can create different kinds of, of studies. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, at least. Uh, I saw a fantastic question from Dr. John Thomas asking, how did the for-profit prison industry uh, inform your analysis, if at all, in this book? In, in two ways. Um, one, kind of tracking um, kind of the workings of, of capital right, and social death. Um, one of the ways in which, one of the differences between mass incarceration and slavery, uh, and th the distinction seems, appears merely academic, but I think it's very important that during the regime of slavery, right, the slave, right, the person who was enslaved is the object of capital investment. Mm -hmm. In mass incarceration, the inmate is not the object of capital investment. The prison is the object of capital investment. And then you have to go out and find people to put in there. Mm. So there's a way in which we've created an economy right, around jails and prisons. And that economy then has lots of, it, well, let me put it like this, it secures lots of political will. Right? So one of the things that you see whenever there's a downturn in the, downturn in the economy there are certain voices that, that will say, okay, now that there's a downturn in the economy, we'll see that we can't afford um, <laughs> these levels of incarceration. But historically, downturns in the economy do not affect right, our investment in jails, prisons, and policing. Mm. Because the, it's the durability of the political will, right, based upon not only the kinds of representations we've talked about, but also the economy that we have built up uh, around, around prisons. So the, the second part I, I would say um, is in a, in a negative sense, <laughs> uh, part of what I had to do in my work is actually in some ways to move beyond the private prison industry mm -hmm. because it's the, the number of I mean, private prisons get a lot of attention because it rightly offends our moral sensibilities, but the vast majority of jails and prisons are still publicly funded. Mm -hmm which means that that's a, a real entry point for thinking about public witness. Right? It's a real entry point for uh, an entire tradition of thinking of, of city, state, uh, um, and county budgets as moral documents. Hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Would anybody like to ask in person? Annabeth uh, Rochley has a question. Dr. Ringer, can you say more about the god of necropolitics? How do you describe this deity's characteristics? In other words, what makes justice-seeking people believe that prisons are okay theologically? And I think we might add on that some of the ideological rationale that is pumped through the media. Um, you know, I think 
in terms of kind of what this idea of what makes justice seeking people believe um, that prisons are okay, I think part of it is um, many of our theologies explicitly or implicitly right, um, have some version of, right, um, vengeance belongs to God. And that there is a way in which the state, right, historically, there's a correlation between the state and, and God. Uh, there's a lot of, of work uh, that's done to show the ways in which kind of the secular state in many ways reoccupies right, the space of God. And it's understandable. I mean, this is why when you see governors who have um, um, the power to, to save life, right, the power to grant clemency. Right? Um, I also think there is a, there's a lack of an alternative theological vision. I think that there is very much within many of our theologies the importance of, of order, even if we don't use the language of, of law and order, um, the idea of an ordered society. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there is still very much uh, the legacy of some of the um, kind of theology that you see during the Puritan era, uh, that there's ways in which um, criminality um, there's something sacred about uh, punishment. Mm. There's something sacred about um, the use of punishment to kind of bring someone either to justice or right, the use of coercion uh, as a means of facilitating repentance right, and, and redemption. We have uh, a, a personal question that's also a professional one. And I love this question from Terrence. Terrence asks, Dr. Ringer, you used a very interdisciplinary method for your research. Can you discuss the challenges and the rewards of this type of methodology in doing religious work? I think the reward uh, is that it enriches our discipline. I think working in, uh, in an interdisciplinary fashion, um, it, it, really, it really reveals um, just how relevant religious and theological studies is. For, um, for society, for the world, for all kinds of domains of, of knowledge and, and life. Um, the challenge is always that um, if you're in religious, uh, if, you're on, if you're on the religious side of the aisle in the academy, uh, we read others, others don't read us. <laughs> so, so if you want that interdisciplinary conversation, you really do have to kind of go out and get it and really be kind of intentional about, about wanting that. Um, I think, um, the other challenge is when you're working in an interdisciplinary fashion um, to keep your religious and theological perspective in view. Um, sometimes you can, you know, spend all of your time, you know, trying to make sure that you're, you know, you've kept up the latest literature coming out of sociology and political science, et cetera, but you also have to make sure you step back and say, wait a minute, how, how's religion? Uh, kind of contributing to the conversation. So keeping your own, um, your own perspective as a religious scholar in view, I think sometimes can be a challenge in, in doing that work. Mm. Well, I think that's a great uh, question to end on. I wanna thank everyone for making the time to come together to celebrate this fantastic achievement. Uh, the challenge that it presents uh, before us as students, as learners, as community members, Dr. Ringer, thank you so much for blessing us and your community with this gift of your intellect and also that of your community because you are a product of so many different relationships. Thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you to Dr. Stone. Thank you to President Ray. Thank you to, to Dean Crowder and to Terrence Mayo. Thank you all so much for joining. We'll look forward to seeing you at our next book launch, hopefully this summer. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you all so much. Thank you.